The most harrowing aspect of war is the unknown. How can we fight what we can't see? The story of aerial observation is the story of war against the unknown. Observation is a relatively young art. Its extensive use began during the First World War when balloons became a familiar sight. Before the advent of the balloon, which gave you the ability to get up above the battlefield, if you needed to see what the enemy was doing, you had to go out there. During the Civil War, before they started using the balloon, there was many stories that I've read of people who would go out on reconnaissance missions and wouldn't come back for two or three days. You had to get into close contact with them or to a higher point on the ground so that you could look down and see what they were doing. By the time World War I rolled around, the ability for troops to move farther and faster in a short amount of time with machinery and all that, uh, the necessity came to be able to see what they were doing quicker. The airplane had been invented by this point, and so in 1911 was the first time that the aircraft was actually used in a, in a military fashion, and that was during the Italian-Turkish War. At first, the enemy didn't know what was going on. The airplane was still so new, people were just fascinated by it, until they found out that shortly after an airplane flew over, artillery fell in on them. And then it occurred to them, oh, you know, these airplanes flying along, they're spotting for the other artillery. Observers now were being used to help artillery zero in on the positions underneath. So you've got someone hanging out, looking down, and eventually carrying a camera. That's how aerial combat came to the fore. You know, one airplane would go up and start taking pictures, they'd send another airplane up to go shoot him down. So now you start getting fighters as well as the observation aircraft. So these guys literally were going out and taking their lives in their own hands trying to get the information that the military needed to act on. But you're flying airplanes that were not really built for observation. They didn't always have the best view from the cockpit. The pilot was trying to fly and trying to uh, write notes at the same time. Now he had to focus on aiming a camera and trying to get, hold it steady. So one picture out of 400 may turn out any good. And so what they ended up doing was they would cut holes in the bottom of the airplanes and mount cameras in their rigid and, and run a, a clicker up to the pilot so that he could operate it. By the end of the war, they would have 60 or 70 airplanes a day doing constant missions just one after another. The need for observation in aerial photography had, had become obvious. By the time World War II came around, they had movie cameras installed in the bombers where the gun turrets were so that they could aim the camera. They would, would take film as they went across Japan on bombing missions with the B-29s. They would actually film it as it was happening, the entire raid, so that you could bring it back. They could look at it and make strategic decisions based off of things that were done on that mission. At the end of World War II, all the airplanes that were designed specifically to be reconnaissance airplanes, those were all discontinued from production. They quit making them. For years and years, we just continued to you know, modify other airplanes to meet our needs, and, and there's a place for that in the military, but surveillance and aerial photography had become a big enough deal by this point, especially with the Soviet Union having atomic weapons. Most thinking Americans now recognize the fact that our country is at war. A war declared against us by the rulers of international communism. The Soviet Union was such a closed off society, it was hard to get human intelligence out of there. So aerial photography and, and, and sampling and all that was very much a necessity. They needed airplanes that could go out and look down and see where the Soviets had been testing their weapons. So they were back to doing what they did in World War II. They converted B-29s into camera planes. They converted B-45 jet bombers into camera planes. And it wasn't until 1954 when the U-2 was developed. That was the first time that the military developed an airplane strictly to be a aerial photography airplane for military purposes. The U-2 had an engine that was modified to operate at well above 75,000 feet. 
they flew so high you couldn't hardly get to them. And multiple camera packages that aimed out in different directions. And extremely high resolution photography. Now that was strategic reconnaissance. What you're trying to find out with a U-2 flying over the Soviet Union is where are their bases, how much missile development has gone on. These are all strategic things. These aren't really useful necessarily on the battlefield. So now you've got this division between the strategic and the tactical. The U-2 was a highly successful airplane. We still use them today. We've been using them since 1954. Viet Cong's strong point has been broken by the precise application of air power, a vital part of this unusual war. By Southeast Asia, they're starting to use infrared sensors. You had all these tall 200-foot trees, and you're supposed to find out what's going on underneath the trees. So on a standard F-4, by the time I flew in them, both your training models and your combat models had infrared sensors. In the heavily defended areas of Southeast Asia, remotely piloted vehicles were used successfully for daylight photographic reconnaissance. Towards the time around Vietnam, that's when you started getting into unmanned vehicles like the Fire Bee drones that they could put cameras on and launch them from underneath the wing of a C-130 Hercules. Three, two, one, two. Clear? These were essentially what looked like a, a gas tank with wings and a jet engine on it. And they would fly a predetermined course at a predetermined speed and altitude and would shoot photos the entire way. When combating an elusive enemy who frequently moves by night and works in small numbers, it can be extremely difficult to locate his position. The thing that became obvious in Southeast Asia was the value of real-time intelligence. The problem all along here has been you got to get the film back. Watch closely now for the parachute recovery, which is commanded at the end of the flight test. Back then, you had to recover the drone in order to get the film canisters out of them. The need for speed was obvious, but technology just didn't exist to do things instantaneous. The necessity is the mother of invention, as they say. It just took the time until technology could catch up. Now, today, an uh, unmanned aerial vehicle flying over Afghanistan can immediately send the footage back to you. My name is Eric Wise. I was a uh, UH-1N helicopter pilot in the uh, Marine Corps. I think the biggest technological leap that I experienced was really the ability to communicate what you are seeing real time to ground commander. You become an instant airborne extension of the ground force that you're supporting. And allowing them to have that situational awareness of what's in front of them or what's behind them is a great tool. The fact that a person at a remote can actually look at a screen giving you real-time intelligence. I think it's saving people's lives. We've gone from people standing in trees looking out at the beginning of the Civil War, and then World War I, you had a guy who had to fly all the way back and tell them what he saw and hope the enemy's in the same place when they get there, to today, where people are in another location deciding whether or not to destroy that target in real time. I think that's a pretty big leap in technology. And I don't think there's any limit to what they can do. This then is aerial reconnaissance, combining the eyes of the eagle, the intelligence of men, and modern firepower. The truth is, the future of aerial observation is as unknown as the information it sought to find over 100 years ago. What we do know is that technology will keep advancing. And though the enemy will try to challenge, avert, and combat our efforts, we will always remain a step ahead of the unknown. <laughs>